In this video, we're going to take a look at how a monopoly uh, maximizes profit. Now, a monopoly is a situation where you only have one seller. So if we think about how this fits into what we've already talked about, we've talked about perfect competition, where there are lots and lots of buyers and sellers and the goods are all identical. As a matter of fact, we could kind of think about this range of competition, I'll call it, We've talked about perfect competition. Let's put that down here on this end. Perfect competition. Lots and lots of buyers and sellers. The goods are all identical. The complete other end of the spectrum is what we're going to talk about now. We're going to think about monopoly. Once we get done with monopoly, in another video we're going to talk about oligopoly, and oligopoly fits right in here. Oligopoly can't spell it, oligopoly, and then we're going to think about monopolistic competition that fits in somewhere down here. So we're going to think about all four of these types of markets. So we're thinking about the two ends of the spectrum first. A lot of what we've done with perfect competition, we'll be able to use that to help us understand what happens in these other markets. So um, let's start with our monopoly discussion and, and the key here is that monopolies have no competition. As a matter of fact, let's list the characteristics of this type of market. So characteristics, we did this with perfect competition. The characteristics were that there were lots and lots of buyers and sellers, the goods were identical, and there was free entry and exit. In terms of monopoly, there's going to be one firm, one seller that has no competition. There's going to be one good. Clearly, if there's only one firm, there's one good. And that good will have no close substitutes. Now, that's going to give this firm what we're going to call market power. This firm will have some control over the price in a way that perfectly competitive firm did not. And then the last characteristic of a monopoly is that there is going to be no entry. I'm going to say that there are strict barriers to entry. Strict barriers to entry. These characteristics, the fact that there's one firm, there are strict barriers to entry, we will say that the monopoly is a price maker. Monopoly is a price maker. They get to choose their price. They have market power. So saying that they are a price maker is, I'm going to also describe that by saying that they have market power. So that phrase, market power, essentially means some control over the price. The monopoly is going to have as much market power as it is possible to have. Now, let's think about what that means for a second. The monopoly is going to be the only seller of a particular good. And sometimes people believe that that, that means the, mar that the monopoly can charge whatever price they want, and that's certainly not true. The monopoly is going to have as much power over price as it's possible to have, but they still can't reach into your pocket and take dollars out. You still have to make the decision to buy the good or not. And so what that means is the monopoly is going to be restricted by the consumer's willingness to pay. So they're not going to be able to charge a, a crazy price if consumers are not willing to pay that price. So let's think about um, before we get into how a monopoly is going to make its decisions on, on what quantity to produce and what price to charge, um, let's think about some sources of barriers to entry. Okay, so let's call this sources of barriers to entry. The first one that we're going to talk about is that the government can block entry. So let's just say there are government sources 
of barriers, and those could come in the form of, say, a patent or a copyright. So sometimes the government grants a patent. If you've come up with a new idea or a new pharmaceutical, um, then you can get a patent for that, and what that patent guarantees is that you'll be the only person that can profit from that particular invention, at least for a period of time, and it might be 18 years. It depends on, on whether we're not, or not we're talking about a mechanical patent or a pharmaceutical patent or something like that. So a patent or a copyright, so you, if you were to, let's say, write a song and, and record that song and it becomes very popular, then you're the only person that can profit for that, from that for a period of time. If anybody else were to try to take your song and make money off of it, or even just use it, even if they're not making money off of it, if they were to use it, they have violated your copyright and you would be able to, to uh, pursue that in a court of law and, and you would typically be able to win if you can prove that it was yours. So sometimes the government creates barriers to entry. Now, here's what we're going to see in this chapter. We're going to see that having a monopoly in a market creates deadweight loss. So later on, we're going to be talking about some things the government might want to do to prevent monopoly. And so you, at that point, you might think back and say, well, hold it. Sometimes the government creates monopoly. Why would they create it and then try to fight it? Well, What's happening is that the government needs to create some type of incentive for people to be productive and for people to innovate and create new products to, to go out and find cures for ailments. And so what the government does is they create this, this patent or a copyright that is going to be the reward for um, the firm that comes up with a cure for cancer or somebody who comes up with a, a very entertaining movie or a very popular book there's that reward. If, if that reward didn't exist, firms would never spend the millions and millions of dollars that it, it takes to develop some new pharmaceutical drug. So there's this fine line. We, we want to create an incentive for firms to innovate and to find new things like a, 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 some cure for something. The problem is once they've found it, they have market power and they're able to use that market power. And so that's kind of a tricky situation, but that's why this exists. The government creates these, these situations because they want to, there to be a reward to being innovative. Another situation where there's a barrier to entry would be if a single firm owns all of a key input. So single firm owns all of a key input. Not really that common, but there are some great examples of this. So if you were to go back and look at a company called Alcoa, there was a period of time during which Alcoa had a monopoly in aluminum production, and the reason is that Alcoa had control of all the bauxite, and you need bauxite to make aluminum. So when they had control of all the bauxite, they were the only people that could, the only business that could make aluminum, so they had a monopoly. Another kind of textbook example is De Beers Diamonds. De Beers owns a vast majority of, of the most productive diamond mines in the world. And so De Beers, um, for all practical purposes, has a monopoly in, in the uh, sale of diamonds. Um, so first two sources of barriers to entry. We could have what's referred to as a natural monopoly. A natural monopoly is a situation where there are economies of scale over the relevant range of production levels. So economies of scale. Exist. Let's think back to what economies of scale mean. We talked about that when we were thinking about costs of production. We talked about um, if we had costs up here and we had quantity down here and our long run average total cost curve was always declining as quantity increased, then we called that, we said the firm is experiencing economies of scale. What this means is it's cheaper to produce larger quantities 
than it is to break that up into smaller quantities and produce it maybe in individual factories. So if we were thinking about this being the total quantity in the market, if we had one firm producing that quantity, then the average total cost would be right up here. Remember, this is the long run average total cost curve. So this would be the average total cost of producing that quantity in one business, one plant. We could think about what would happen if we had two plants each making half of that amount. Well, half of this amount would be this. Here's Q over two. So if each firm was making half that amount, we could think about what would happen to their costs on average and their long run average total costs would be up here. So you can see that there are economies of scale. There is a benefit to getting bigger. If we did have two companies, there would be an incentive for those two companies to merge and produce all of that quantity in one production facility so that they can reduce their costs on average. We tend to see this in things like utilities. So if we're talking about delivery of water to households, the delivery of water to households through a set of pipes, well, typically you have one water company in an area and you might say, well, let's suppose that you had, um, I don't know, in your backyard you had a giant lake of clean, fresh water and you wanted to sell that, pe sell that to people and you wanted to be able to deliver that through pipes to their house. Well, you could go to the other water utility and say, hey, um, would you let me borrow your pipes so that I can pump my water through your pipes to people's houses? And they're going to say no, clearly. So what's going to happen is you're going to have to lay another set of pipes to everybody's house. Well, laying two sets of pipes just drives the cost up on average. So in a situation like water utilities, clearly it's a natural monopoly. It's cheaper to have one firm than it is to have multiple firms. And, and that's really the nature of, or a result of the uh, shape of the long run average total cost curve. So you can see that these sources of barriers to entry, are these aren't things that you go to uh, get your MBA to learn, right? You, you don't, businesses don't have lots of market power. Businesses don't become a monopoly by making good decisions. It, this is really something that's kind of a, you kind of luck into it or the government, you, you create something that, that is very useful that lots of people want to buy and you have a patent on it. That's going to create a lot of market power for you. So let's talk now about what profit maximization looks like for a monopoly. So here's the key. This is really for a monopoly what it boils down to. The monopoly faces the market demand curve. The monopoly faces the market demand curve. We talked about perfect competition. Perfect competition or competitive markets, that's a situation where there are lots and lots of buyers and sellers. So no individual seller faces the market demand curve. Actually in perfect competition, each seller faces a perfectly elastic demand curve for their product. And the reason is each firm is selling a good for which there are perfect substitutes. So if one particular firm tries to raise its price, consumers will just go to the other firms that are selling the exact same good. In this situation, we've got a firm that has no competition. Consumers can't go to another business to buy the good. They either buy it or they don't. That's the decision they have to make. So the monopoly faces the market demand curve. The monopoly, we already said, is a price maker. They get to choose their price. Competitive firms had no control over the price. It went up or down depending upon what happened to market demand. There's nothing they could do or what happened to market supply. They have no control over it, but a monopoly does. They are limited by consumer willingness to pay. Let's think about what this means about the marginal revenue curve because what we're going to do is the same thing we did with perfect competition. We're going to look where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, but now what we're going to see is that this firm faces a different type of marginal revenue curve than a competitive firm did. So let's do the same thing we did with perfect competition. Let's create a little table here that allows us to look at total revenue. We'll calculate marginal revenue. We'll calculate average revenue. And we'll just see what average or what marginal revenue looks like. 
So let's put up here the demand curve that the firm faces. Let's start with quantities and let's go from zero up to 10. And then let's think about price. Now, when we were doing a perfectly competitive firm, remember the perfectly competitive firm was small compared to the size of the market. So it didn't matter the quantity that the perfectly competitive firm produced, they had no impact on the price. So that our column, our price column for the competitive firm was all the same. It was $6 all the way down. Now we're putting up here the market demand curve. So what we know is demand curves are downward sloping and so if the monopoly wants to sell more, a higher quantity, they have to lower the price on every unit they sell. So let's put here, let's start our price here at $6 and let's just go down by 50 cents each time. $5.50, $5.00, so you can fill the rest of this in by going down by 50 cents each time. And we'll draw this demand curve so it goes down to a dollar. We can draw this demand curve. It's very simple. The choke price, the highest price that consumers are willing to pay is six dollars. We call that the choke price because that's the price at which quantity demanded falls to zero. At a price like seven, nobody wants to buy any of it. So if we draw the rest of that demand curve, it's going down, it's got a slope of 50 cents. It goes down 50 cents every time it goes over one. So by the time it gets out here to 10, it's down here at a dollar. So there's what that demand curve looks like. It's just a downward sloping linear demand curve like we've worked with before. Let's figure out what total revenue looks like. Total revenue, is just price times quantity. So if the firm sells zero units, of course they make zero revenue. If they sell one unit at $5.50, they make $5.50 in total. If they sell two units at $5 each, they get a total revenue of $10. Remember, these are not profit. These are total revenue. So here's what the rest of those look like. It's going to be $13.50 $16, $17.50, $18, again, $16, and $10. So look at what total revenue is doing. Total revenue is going up and then it reaches a maximum and then it starts to go down. Again, this is not profit. This is just total revenue. And, and so what's happening here is you have to remember that the way that to interpret this table is not that the firm sells the first unit for $5.50 and the second, second unit for $5 and the third unit for $4.50. That's not what's happening. This tells us the price they can charge if they want to sell four units. If they want to sell four units, they have to sell all four of those units for $4. If instead they want to sell eight units, they have to lower the price to $2 per unit. Okay. Now that we've got total revenue, we can let's figure out average revenue. Now remember, average revenue is always equal to price, and here's why. We know that total revenue is equal to price times quantity. Average revenue is equal to total revenue divided by Q. So if we take price times quantity divided by Q, the quantities cancel. Average revenue is just equal to price. That's always true. So our average revenue here, um, we're not going to calculate. We can't divide by zero. But if we take our, our um, total revenue and divide it by quantity, 550 divided by a quantity of 1 gives us 550, which is the price. $10 divided by 2 is 5, which is the price. So this is just the price all the way down. 454 goes down by 50 cents each time. So it's the same as this column. So there's what average revenue looks like. Let's figure out what marginal revenue looks like because that's what we're really interested in. 
marginal revenue. Remember, marginal revenue is just the change in total revenue when we change quantity. Okay. Sometimes, a lot of times, I write it this way, change in total revenue when you change quantity. But marginal revenue is just the slope of the total revenue curve. So what we need to look at, we're going to not do anything for zero. We need to go from zero to one. We see that as if we produce, if we produce that first unit, our total revenue goes from zero to 550. So our marginal revenue for that first unit is 550. If we, we produce the second unit, our total revenue goes from 550 to 10. So it goes up by $4.50. If we produce the third unit, our total revenue goes from 10 to 13.50. So our marginal revenue is three dollars and fifty cents. You can see that our marginal revenue is falling by a dollar each time. So it goes down here to 2.50, and then 1.50, um, 50 cents, and then it goes negative. If we take 50 cents minus a dollar, that's negative 50 cents, and then minus a dollar fifty, minus 2.50 minus 350. So there's what our marginal revenue looks like. Now let's think about what's going on here. Notice that marginal revenue at all of these <coughs> production levels down here we see that marginal revenue is less than price. Let's think back to what happened with the perfectly competitive firm. So with the perfectly competitive firm we saw that price and marginal revenue were always equal. Every time the unit or the firm sold another unit, they made six dollars. Sell another unit, you make six dollars. Sell another unit, you make six dollars. Every time you sell a unit, you make six dollars, which means your marginal revenue is always six dollars. Here, this isn't happening for this firm. If it wants to sell another unit, it's got to lower the price for every unit it sells. So its marginal revenue of the next unit is going to go down. And so what we're seeing here is that marginal revenue is less than price. We see that for a monopoly, marginal revenue is less than price. That is important. Okay. What we want to do is we want to graph the marginal revenue curve. But in order to do that, I need to clear off this side. I'm going to leave the table and then we'll take a look at what the marginal revenue curve looks like. Let's draw the uh, demand curve that we've got here again, and then let's draw also the marginal revenue curve and see what they look like compared to each other. So here's, this is going to be the, the demand curve that the firm faces. So our demand curve starts up here at $6, and it's linear, and by the time we get out here to a quantity of 10, it's down at $1. But we're really interested in this marginal revenue curve. So notice that the marginal revenue starts out here at the first unit at 550. It starts out somewhere like this. And then by the time it gets out here to a quantity of um, six or seven, it's going to cross the horizontal axis and become negative. So the marginal revenue curve actually looks like this. Here's the demand curve the firm faces. There's the marginal revenue curve. Marginal revenue is below price. In other words, if we graph this, the marginal revenue curve is linear also, but notice it has twice the slope as the demand curve. The slope of the demand curve here is 50 cents. When we go down 50 cents over one unit, down 50 cents over one unit, our marginal revenue, we go down a dollar over a unit, down a dollar. So this marginal revenue curve has twice the slope as the demand curve. As a matter of fact, in terms of graphing the marginal revenue curve, here's the general rule. And this is something you need to remember because there will be times when you may be given the demand curve and you have to figure out what the marginal revenue curve that goes with it looks like. Well, here's the rule for doing it. And, and this rule works for a linear demand curve. So I'm going to say for a linear demand curve, If, it's, if the demand curve is nonlinear, then this isn't going to work. But in this class, we would be using a, a linear demand curve. So this will work for everything that we're going to do. So for a linear demand curve, 
the marginal revenue curve has the same vertical intercept as the same vertical intercept and twice the slope as the demand curve. Same vertical intercept and twice the slope as the demand curve. So drawing a marginal revenue curve, if you're given the demand curve, drawing the marginal revenue curve is not hard at all. So if I were to give you a demand curve that looks like this, then you just start your marginal revenue curve up here where the demand curve starts and you give it twice the slope. There's the marginal revenue curve that would go with that demand curve. Or if I were to give you a functional form for a demand curve, suppose I said that the demand curve is equal to 10 minus uh, 2q. There's a demand curve. It has a vertical intercept of 10 and a slope of negative 2. That's just the slope intercept form of a line. Well, our marginal revenue curve would have the same intercept and twice the slope. There's the marginal revenue curve. It also has an intercept of 10, but its slope is negative 4 instead of negative 2. So you can see that this general rule is very useful. Let's talk for just a second about whether or not that rule worked for a perfectly competitive firm. So for a perfectly competitive firm, that perfectly competitive firm faced a perfectly elastic demand curve for its product. The demand curve that the perfectly or that the competitive firm faced looked like that. And what we saw was that the marginal revenue curve was right on top of the demand curve. So let's think about whether or not the uh, rule that we've got here works in this case. Well, so the marginal revenue curve and the demand curve have the same vertical intercept. It's right here. And then the slope of the demand curve, if we took the slope of the demand curve is 0, 2 times 0 is 0. So the marginal revenue curve does indeed have twice the slope of the demand curve because they're both equal to 0. So for the perfect, perfectly competitive firm, the rule still follows. The key here is that if the demand curve is perfectly elastic, then the marginal revenue curve will lie right on top of it. But as soon as this demand curve has any downward slope, the marginal revenue curve is going to fall below it. Okay? Whatever downward slope it has, the, the, the demand curve has, the marginal revenue curve will have twice that downward slope. Okay? So now we've got what we need. We know what the marginal revenue curve looks like for a perfectly competitive firm. All we need to do is put that together with our cost information and we can look where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal and that's going to tell us what the firm is going to do. So I'll clear this off and then we'll take a look at that. So the way a monopoly maximizes profit is the exact same way that every firm maximizes profit. We saw in our perfect competition chapter that all firms maximize profit by producing the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So that's the thing that we're looking for. Anytime we're thinking about a firm maximizing profit, if you're stumped on how to solve a problem, and, and it's a, a problem where a firm is maximizing profit, that's the first thing you need to be looking for. Figure out where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Okay? That may involve taking a demand curve and, and drawing the marginal revenue curve. It may involve taking a table of numbers and figuring out total revenue and then figuring out marginal revenue. But the goal is always going to be to look where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So let's think about what this looks like for a monopoly. So let's draw a picture of a monopoly. And I'm going to put up here the, the cost curves for the monopoly first. So let's put up here the marginal cost. Let's go ahead and put our average total cost curve. There's average total cost. So there's a picture of our monopoly. Let's make sure we label it monopoly. 
Now, notice that if I were drawing a perfectly competitive firm, I would have drawn that picture also. The cost curves of the firm are not what's different between the different types of markets. It's the revenue for the firm that's different between a perfectly competitive firm versus a monopoly versus a monopolistically competitive firm versus an oligopoly. So this stuff, anytime we draw a picture of the firm, most of the time we're going to be drawing this picture. So now we want to put the revenue information in there. So I'm going to put in the demand curve that the firm faces. I'm going to just draw it out here. It doesn't really matter. Don't really worry too much about where it intersects everything. Now we're going to be looking where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So we need the marginal revenue that goes with that firm. So the marginal revenue curve has the same intercept and twice the slope, so it's going to come down here something like that. There's our marginal revenue curve. And again, don't worry exactly where it intersects everything. There's really only one intersection that we're interested in, and that's the one where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So the firm is going to produce the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That happens right here. And, and in your picture, your intersection right there might be above the average total cost curve. It might be a long ways from it. It doesn't matter. That's the only intersection that's important at this point. So this is the quantity that the firm is going to produce. There's, I'm going to call it QM for the monopoly quantity. Now let's think about the price that the monopoly is going to charge for this. So there's the quantity that they want to produce. If this was a competitive firm, that's the end of the story because the competitive firm has no control over the price, but the monopoly does. And what the monopoly is going to want to do is charge the highest price that they can get for that particular quantity. And fortunately for the monopoly, they know what that, what that is because the demand curve, the height of it, represents consumer willingness to pay. So they know how much consumers are willing to pay for that particular quantity. So we simply go up to the demand curve for that particular quantity and we can see that consumers are willing to pay that amount. That is the monopoly price. That's the price the monopoly will charge. So they will produce this quantity, they will charge that price. So that's a picture of the profit maximizing decision for the monopoly. Now let's take a look at another example here. What I want to do is focus on the relationship for the monopoly between price and marginal cost. So let's draw a smaller picture here. I'm going to put my marginal cost. For this picture I'm not going to put my average total cost because I want to focus on marginal cost. Let's go ahead and put the demand curve that the firm faces. It's downward sloping. Let's put the marginal revenue curve that the firm faces. It's right there. The firm's going to produce the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And that happens right there. There's the quantity the monopoly produces. They're going to charge a price found by looking at the demand curve. So we go up to the demand curve. They're going to charge this price. Now let's look at the relationship between price and marginal cost. So let's identify the marginal cost of producing this quantity. Well that's easy. All we have to do is go up from this quantity to the marginal cost curve and we hit it right there. There's the marginal cost of producing the quantity that the monopoly is producing. And what we see is that the, for the monopoly, price is greater than marginal cost. Okay? So for a monopoly, price ends up being greater than marginal cost, which is not surprising because we also saw that um, for a monopoly, the marginal revenue is less than price, and the monopoly is equating marginal revenue and marginal cost, so this shouldn't come as a big surprise. But here's the practical interpretation of what's going on here. Remember that for a perfectly competitive firm, price was equal to marginal cost. That meant that when you buy a product from a firm that's perfectly competitive, you can be assured the price they charge you is equal to their cost of production. Well, here's what this means. For a monopoly, they charge you a price that's greater than marginal cost. That means when you buy a good from a monopoly, you can be assured that the price they charge you is greater than their cost of production. 
this will end up creating some dead weight loss and we'll see that here in just a little bit. First, let's talk about how we identify profit. So let's draw a couple of pictures here. Um, remember that profit is equal to the difference between price and average total cost multiplied by Q. So let's draw a picture. Actually, let's draw two pictures. One of them, we're going to have a firm earning a positive profit, and then the other one, we're going to have a firm, a monopoly, earning a negative profit. Um, so let's start this one with our marginal cost. Let's put our average total cost down here kind of low. So here's average total cost. Still U-shaped, still inter marginal cost still intersects average total cost at the bottom of the average total cost curve. Now let's put our demand curve in here. There's the demand curve the firm faces. Here's the marginal revenue curve. The firm is going to produce the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That happens right here. Here's the quantity the firm is going to produce. There's QM. They're going to use the demand curve to figure out the highest price they can charge for it. So we go up to the demand curve. There's the monopoly price. Now we've got price and we've got quantity. We need the average total cost. So if we go up from this quantity to the average total cost curve, we hit it right there. There's the average total cost of producing that quantity. And this area would represent the profit that the firm is earning. So this is a firm earning a profit that is positive. Being a monopoly does not guarantee you a positive profit, though. If the demand for this product was relatively low, so just because you're the only seller of something does not mean that people want to buy it. So let's draw a picture where let's start with our marginal cost. I'm going to put my average total cost kind of high this time. I'm going to put it somewhere right up in here. Here's average total cost. Now I'm going to move my demand curve back. I'm going to move my demand curve down here where it's under the average total cost curve. So suppose there's my demand curve. I'm going to draw the marginal revenue curve that goes with that demand curve. There's marginal revenue. The firm's going to look where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal, and that happens right here. So this will be the quantity that the firm will produce. There's QM. We go up to the demand curve to find the price. There's the price they're going to charge. That's PM. Now we need the average total cost of this quantity. So we go up to the average total cost. Now we hit it up here. There's average total cost, and now we see that average total cost is bigger than price. So the area of this rectangle is going to be the loss that this monopoly earns. This is a firm, a monopoly, earning a negative profit, a loss. So again, being the monopoly doesn't guarantee you a positive profit. It depends on where that market demand curve is relative to the uh, cost curves. Let's talk about the supply curve for a monopoly. And it turns out that this discussion is relatively easy to have because the monopoly has no supply curve. Monopoly has no supply curve. Let's talk about what that means. So the monopoly clearly makes a supply decision. The monopolist is going to decide how much to sell. In all of these pictures, the monopoly is choosing a quantity to sell. But we have to be careful about labeling anything a supply curve. Actually, we can't label anything a supply curve, and let's talk about why. So if we were talking about a competitive firm, so let me draw you a picture of a competitive firm. Here's our competitive firm. We've got the marginal cost curve. I'm not going to draw any average total cost curve or anything like that. The way the, mon the competitive firm made its decision is it, it looked at where the market price was. Wherever that market price was, all it had to do was go over to the d marginal cost curve, and that gives us the quantity. So if the price is P1, quantity will be Q1. If price falls down here to P2, quantity is going to be Q2. 
or if price were to go up here to P3, quantity is going to be Q3. So what happens is that that marginal cost curve tells us everything we need to know. That's why we can just label that thing a supply curve. With a monopoly, the marginal cost curve does not tell us everything that, that we need to know. The marginal cost curve is important for figuring out what the quantity is going to be, but notice then we have to use a third curve. We've got to use this demand curve to figure out the price. So here, the marginal cost curve is, is helpful for figuring out the quantity, but the marginal cost curve doesn't help us figure out the price. We've got to use the demand curve. So in our monopoly pictures, notice we're using three curves. We've got to use the marginal cost curve and the marginal revenue curve to first figure out quantity. And then we've got to use a third curve, the demand curve, to figure out the price. There are three curves involved in figuring everything out, whereas with our perfectly competitive firm, there was only one curve involved. And so we could just label it a supply curve. So what we're saying when we say that the monopoly has no supply curve is we're saying that we, we can't label anything a supply curve they still make a decision of what quantity to sell. Okay? It's just that we can't label one of, one of these curves a supply curve. Um, let's talk about the difference between the short run and the long run. So when we discussed perfect competition, we spent a long time talking about the firm's supply curves in the short run and what the market supply curve looked like in the short run and the long run. And so we spent time thinking about the difference between the short run and the long run. We spent time thinking about the effect that a change in market demand has first in the short run and then in the long run. We don't have to do any of that in the case of the monopoly because there's no entry that takes place in a monopoly. That makes things nice and simple because if a monopoly is earning positive profit in the short run like this firm is, they can continue to earn that positive profit in the long run because there's no entry. There are strict barriers to entry. So there's nothing that's going to drive that profit to zero. So we don't need to worry about the difference between the short run and the long run because there's no entry. There's nothing that's going to end up causing anything to change in that picture. Um, I want to clear this off and then we'll talk about a couple of things before we kind of finish this up. Let's talk about the effect that having a monopoly in a market has on total surplus. So let's think about um, the effect of a monopoly on the efficiency of markets, which is something we spent a, uh, a video talking about earlier. What I want to do is draw two pictures here. Let's draw a picture of a competitive market and a monopoly market. So this is going to be a monopoly. And this one's going to be a perfectly competitive market. Not a perfectly competitive firm, a competitive market. Competitive market. So let's start by putting in the market demand curve. Okay, now what I want to do is I'm going to draw the same market demand curve in each picture. Because the market demand curve has to do with the consumers. Okay, so that's not a difference necessarily between a competitive market and a monopoly market. Now I'm going to draw the marginal cost curve and I'm going to draw the marginal cost curve here like we would have drawn it back when we first learned the um, demand and supply model. I'm going to draw it like this and I'm going to label it a supply curve. So in a competitive market, we know now that that market supply curve, at least in the short run, is the horizontal summation of all of the individual firm marginal cost curves. This is just a marginal cost curve itself. Now, over in our monopoly picture, I can put the marginal cost curve also, and it's going to look like this marginal cost curve but I'm not going to label it a supply curve because over there we know we can't label any one curve as a supply curve. So I'm just going to call it a marginal cost curve. Still represents the marginal cost of production. Now the way that a competitive market works is we know that the market price is driven to the intersection of this market demand curve and the market 
supply curve. So we get P star and we get Q star. And we talked about consumer and producer surplus. We know that our consumer surplus would be this area up here. Our producer surplus is this area down here. All of the area under the demand curve and above the supply curve represents total surplus. And we know with a, com with a competitive market, total surplus is maximized. Let's talk about what happens though with a monopoly. So with a monopoly, when the monopoly maximizes its profit, it doesn't care where the marginal cost curve and the demand curve intersect. It's going to be looking where the marginal cost curve and the marginal revenue curve intersect. So we've got to put our marginal revenue curve up there. This will be the quantity that the monopoly produces. This is QM. And they're going to charge a price found on the demand curve. So we go up to the demand curve and there's the price the monopoly will charge. So now we can use these two pictures to compare what would happen in a competitive market to what happens with a monopoly. And the first thing that we can see is that the quantity with the monopoly is going to be smaller than the quantity with a competitive firm or with a competitive market. With a competitive market, this would be the free, the quantity that gets produced, but what happens is the monopolist uses its market power to restrict quantity and drive price up. So we see that with a monopoly, quantity is lower than it would be with competition, and we see with a monopoly, price ends up being higher than it would be with a perfectly competitive market. So the monopoly is using its control over price. It's using its market power to restrict quantity and drive price up. Okay. We'll see, we'll draw a picture here in a second, but you can see that consumer surplus is going to be smaller with the monopoly than it would be with the competitive market. You'll also see, you can see it in this picture, we'll draw another picture, but because the monopoly reduces quantity, it's going to create some dead weight loss, which is going to be this area right in here, these triangles right there. You can see the dead weight loss as that area right in there. Same as what we saw when we were thinking about uh, a price floor or a price ceiling or a tax, it's going to create dead weight loss because it pushes us away from that free market quantity. Let's draw a different picture with a monopoly now and let's just identify some different areas so we can see the effect on consumer and producer surplus. So, I'm going to put my uh, marginal cost up here. Let's put the demand curve that the firm faces, the marginal revenue curve. Here's the quantity the firm produces, QM. Here's the price they charge. Um, we'll call it PM. Let's identify our perfectly competitive price, which would be right there. I don't need to draw P. Here would be the quantity produced in a perfectly competitive market. The intersection of the demand and supply curves would be right there. So we can label, I'm going to label this bigger triangle right up here. Let's label it big A. So A here represents, I realize there's a line cutting it in half, but A represents that. B represents the area of this rectangle right here. Here's C. D is going to be all of this kind of trapezoid looking area and let's call that E. So with a competitive market, perfect competition, consumer surplus would be A plus B plus C. And with perfect competition, producer surplus would be D plus E. But let's think about what happens with the monopoly. Let's start with consumer surplus. Consumer surplus with the monopoly is just area A. So the loss of consumer surplus is B plus C compared to perfect competition. Um, producer surplus with the monopoly ends up being all of the area under the price and above this marginal cost curve, which is B plus D. And then finally, let's talk about the deadweight loss. So this will be the deadweight loss of monopoly. This is total surplus that we miss out on because the 
monopoly is using its market power to restrict the market quantity, the deadweight loss would be C plus E. Now let's think about this for a second. Having the monopoly in the market creates deadweight loss, but the monopoly is doing nothing wrong. The monopoly is simply maximizing its profit. So when we think about this deadweight loss, we're looking at that from society's viewpoint. We're saying that the economic pie is not as big as it could possibly be. But again, that's not because the monopoly is doing anything wrong. The monopoly is making as much profit as it can make. So the goal of the monopoly is not to maximize total surplus. The goal of the monopoly is to maximize its profit. That's, that should be the goal of the monopoly. It's just that it ends up having this negative side effect on society that it creates deadweight loss. Because of that deadweight loss, um, the government may have some desire to step in and, and prevent there being a monopoly in a market or fix it if there is a monopoly. So let's talk about some government policy towards monopoly. And let's start by thinking about some antitrust legislation. So antitrust legislation, you can think about this as the anti-market power legislation or the anti-monopoly legislation. And really the first piece of antitrust legislation was the, the Sherman Antitrust Law of 1890 and there were lots and lots of other antitrust laws that came along after that. But essentially that, that Sherman Antitrust Law gave the power, the government the power to do a, a few different things to try to prevent this deadweight loss of monopoly, try to prevent a firm from having too much market power. One of the things that the Sherman antitrust legislation and other pieces of legislation have uh, given the um, Justice Department the ability to do is to prevent mergers. So if there were two really big companies like Coke and Pepsi and they wanted to merge into one big soft drink company, they would have to uh, run that by the um, Justice Department and the Justice Department would most likely say no we're not going to allow that. Um, so the, the Justice Department has the ability to, to prevent mergers. I believe they have to argue it in front of a, a, uh, a federal judge so it's not that the Justice Department has a final say. I think the companies might be able to appeal it. That's beyond what we need to worry about right now. So the government can prevent mergers. Um, they can break companies up. The government has the ability, again, if they argue before a federal judge and the federal judge agrees with them, they can break companies up. This is how uh, Bell Telephone was broken up decades ago into what became known as the Baby Bell um, companies. And so essentially the Justice Department determined that Bell Telephone had a monopoly in, in the market for telephone service and it broke it up into uh, some smaller companies, each with a smaller amount of market share. And the idea there is it creates competition between those companies. And you know, there, if one company has, if there's just one company, they're going to use their market power. But if it's multiple companies competing against each other, then it's a different type of market. It's an oligopoly. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So the government can uh, break companies up. Another thing that the government can do is regulate the monopolist. Regulate the monopoly. So the government could, instead of breaking it up, they could go in and say, hey, you've got to charge a price equal to this, or you need to produce this quantity. Um, this is common in the case of a natural monopoly. Common with natural monopoly. Let's think about how that can be kind of a challenge, though. Turns out that if we think about a natural monopoly, a natural monopoly, the cost curves are going to be a little bit different than kind of what we've drawn right here. If we think about a natural monopoly, we can think about a natural monopoly as being a situation where the average total cost is constantly declining. So what the cost curves tend to look like for a natural monopoly 
is this. We tend to have a, a constant marginal cost, and then our average total cost is declining. Now, when your cost curves look like this, this means that there is some fixed cost. If fixed cost was zero, then the average total cost curve and the marginal cost curve would be the same curve. But if there's a fixed cost, then our average total cost is always going to be declining. So we have a picture that looks like this. This is the cost curves for a, a natural monopoly. Let's put the demand curve that the firm faces. Let's put the, the market demand curve. Now if this monopoly was able to make its own decisions, then we would look at the marginal revenue curve, which would have the same intercept. I, my intercept would be up here. But my marginal revenue curve would come down like this. There's marginal revenue. The firm would look where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, which would happen right here. They'd produce this quantity and charge this price. There's our monopoly quantity. There's our monopoly price. So now let's think about what would happen if, say, the government came in and regulated the monopoly to charge a price equal to marginal cost, say. Suppose the government said, you know what, we're not going to let you charge a price that's higher than um, your cost of production. Well, if they forced them to charge a price that's equal to their marginal cost, then the price they charge would be right down here. The problem is that here would be their average total cost of production. If we go up from this quantity, here's the average total cost of production. Here's average, excuse me, average total cost. Well, if they're forced to charge a price equal to marginal cost, their price would be below average total cost. They'd make a negative profit. They exit the market in the long run. So the government has to be careful in terms of the regulation that it imposes on a natural monopoly because some types of regulation could drive the natural monopoly out of the market. Um, the government could also say, you know what? Instead of producing this quantity, you have to produce the the competitive market quantity. This quantity where the demand curve intersects what would be the supply curve in this market if it were perfectly competitive. So they could force them to, char to produce this quantity and charge a price equal to marginal cost, but then again, their average total cost is going to be higher than the price they can charge. They would exit the market in the long run. So it, the government, it, it's, it's not as simple as you might think for the government to um, regulate, especially a natural monopoly. The final thing that we'll think about is, let me sneak it right in here, the, the last thing that we could think about the government doing in terms of monopoly is to do nothing. One of the challenges with the government stepping in to fix the deadweight loss of a monopoly is that there's this other thing that, that tends to happen and we call it government failure. There's a lack of accountability a lot of times when the government steps in. So if we think about the problem with this, the problem with doing some of these things is that there's a lack of accountability And so sometimes when the government steps in to try to fix a problem, they create a bigger deadweight loss than the one they're trying to fix. And so the last thing we would want is for the government to step in, try to fix something, and then create a bigger problem than the one they're originally trying to fix. One of the problems with government, it's a problem if we're thinking about fixing things. It's not a problem in terms of how the government functions, is that there's, there's relatively long lags in terms of the government's ability to take action. And those lags are built into the Constitution for a reason. I can give you lots of examples where when the government acts very quickly, people are not helped by that. And so we have to be very careful about the government taking very swift action. Sometimes there are, are times when that needs to happen. Sometimes you wish that they could take action quickly and they can't. But for most cases, we don't want the government acting very rapidly, and those, those um, 
lags in government action make it hard to solve problems like this. The lack of accountability makes it really, really challenging to, um, to get a government situation where, um, you know, the, the government is going to be able to do much of all, anything that's very effective. One thing, let, let's put in here, now that I think about it, I kind of skipped over one of the important ones that we need to think about. Sometimes the government just takes the monopoly over. So let's put here, instead of after breaking companies up, the government can take the monopoly over. That's the case of the U.S. Postal Service. It's a situation where the government took control of delivery of mail. And so you can see why, I mean, if, <laughs> frankly, I, I'm... I worked at the post office for many years and I can tell you there are a lot of things, there are a lot of hardworking people that work at the post office. And they, they do an amazing job of delivering the mail that they deliver. It's, after working there for many years, it's, it's kind of surprising to me that as many things get delivered as, as actually do get delivered. But the problem is that they're terribly inefficient. Um, and part of that is that there's a lack of accountability. It's a government institution, and so the government is not held to the types of accountability that a private firm would be held to. So you have to be really careful with this taking something over. Um, there may be a time when that needs to happen, but most of the time, at least my personal opinion would be, that's probably not the first thing we need to, to uh, take a look at. So these give you some, some ideas uh, about what the government can do. Um, a lot of times they do nothing. And, and you know, maybe, maybe dealing with that deadweight loss of monopoly um, is, is fine. We didn't talk about it, but there really aren't that many cases of a good monopoly. I, I gave you, in when we were talking about the sources of barriers to entry, we talked about De Beers and we talked about Alcoa, but there really aren't that many cases where there's what we would consider a pure monopoly. Um, I, honestly, I can't come up with what I would consider a, a perfect example of a pure monopoly. So it's not that common, um, but where it does exist, it's going to create some deadweight loss. What we want to do now is kind of clear this off and finish up by talking about some different pricing strategies. We need to talk about uh, what we're going to call price discrimination and how a monopoly might be able to make even more profit than it would if it charged only a single price. So we'll clear this off and take a look at that. Let's talk about price discrimination now. So price discrimination is the act of charging different consumers different prices for the exact same good. And we'll talk about the conditions under which a firm can do this. This is not illegal. They, a, a firm can't price discriminate based upon a uh, protected category like um, gender or race or anything like that. But in terms of um, geographic location, Firms do not have to sell the same good on the West Coast for a pri the same price that they sell that good here around the Midwest. And so firms can um, price discriminate based upon age. So there can be senior citizens discounts. There can be student discounts. There can be military discounts. Those are situations where the firm is selling the exact same product to different groups of consumers for different prices. So let's think about why the firm would want to do this. If the firm can price discriminate, they can increase their profit. So the idea here is that kind of the simplest way to think about different groups is, let's think about two groups with different willingness to pay. Two groups, different willingness to pay. So we may have a, a one group with a high willingness to pay and one group with a low willingness to pay. So if we think about what's happening there, if the firm is able to prevent the two groups from selling or buying the good from each other, if the firm can sell 
to this group and sell to this group and be able to identify who's in each group, then they can make more profit than if they just chose one price to sell to everybody. So if we've got a, a monopoly that cannot price discriminate, we would call that a single price monopoly. But if we've got a monopoly that is able to price discriminate, then we would call that a multiple price monopoly or, or a price discriminating monopolist. So let's think of an example. Let's suppose that I draw two pictures here. I'm going to have one group where we have a high willingness to pay and one group where we have a low willingness to pay. I'm actually going to, for these pictures, I'm going to simplify the marginal cost and the average total cost. The picture I erased over here, we used a constant marginal cost. I'm going to do that over here. And I'm going to, to also make it even more simple than that. I'm going to assume that our fixed cost is zero. If we assume that, then our marginal cost and our average total cost will be equal. So it's just a simplifying assumption. We could do this with upward sloping marginal cost and, and everything would be fine, but this, this allows us to focus on, on the effect of the price discrimination a little bit better. So these are going to be, let's, let me draw my marginal cost in each so here's marginal cost equals average total cost in each picture. Price, quantity. Now over in this picture, let's, uh, let's put our low willingness to pay group. Low willingness to pay, and then in this picture we'll put the high willingness to pay. Now remember that willingness to pay is represented by the height of the demand curve. So let's draw the high willingness to pay group first. That means that at every quantity, their willingness to pay is going to be higher than this group. So I'm going to put my demand curve that the firm faces up relatively high. Let's put in our left picture, let's put a relatively low willingness to pay. Remember the firm is not in control of the willingness to pay. So this group has a demand curve that's below that group's demand curve. Now the firm, remember, isn't interested, so here's the demand curve. The firm's not interested in where the demand curve intersects the marginal revenue curve. They're interested in where the marginal revenue curve intersects the marginal cost curve. And so if we put our marginal revenue on here for each picture, now we can figure out the quantity that they're going to produce and the price that they're going to charge. So the firm will charge this or produce in the, for this low willingness to pay group this quantity and charge this price. For the high willingness to pay group, the firm will produce this quantity. This is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost in this picture and charge this price. So you can see that the firm, the monopoly, would charge, not surprisingly, the high willingness to pay group a higher price. And the low willingness to pay group, they'll charge a lower price. Let's think about the situation that this firm would be in if they could only charge one price to everybody. So if they could only charge one price to everybody, they would look at the marginal, or excuse me, the, the market demand curve in, that they face. We could sum these two mark. Uh, demand curves together to get the market demand curve. But let's make it more simple than that. Suppose they could only pick one of these two prices. Well, if they were to pick this price, if they picked the high price and they tried to charge that to everybody, then none of these consumers would buy the good, right? Looks like eh, there might be a couple people up there that might buy the good. Or, so if they choose this price, they're not going to sell to most of these people down here. These people just wouldn't buy it. Or they could choose this lower price, and all of these people represented along this portion of the demand curve would buy the good. And then these people over here, many of them would want to buy it, but this price would be too low over here. They would be selling the good to these consumers for an inefficiently low price. So if they choose one or the other prices, they're just not going to make as much profit as if they were able to choose the right price for this group and the right price for that group. But now here's the problem. The firm has to prevent, be able to prevent what we call arbitrage. So let's suppose what would happen if somebody in this group 
bought the good at this price and then was able to go over to people in this group and say, hey, I'll sell you the good for a price that's less than what the monopoly would charge you, but more than what the monopoly charged me. Notice that there's a, if I were to extend this over here, there's a range of prices here that would work for these people and these people. There's a price somewhere in the middle like that where it would make these people better off. They're able to buy it at this price and sell it for that. And it would make these people better off because they're able to buy it at this price and it would have cost them that if they bought it from the monopoly. We call that arbitrage. If you're able to buy at a discount and sell it to somebody else, you're making some money off that. You're arbitraging the difference in prices. So for price discrimination to work, the firm has to be able to prevent arbitrage. They have to be able to prevent people in one group that are able to buy it at the discount from selling it to people in the other group that don't get the discount. So let's think about some categories that the firm can price discriminate on. So I mentioned a couple of them. They can discriminate based on geography. They can discriminate based on age. So they can give senior citizens discounts. They can give uh, student discounts. They can price discriminate based on income. Universities do this. Universities char give different amounts of financial aid to different students. That is classic price discrimination. They're charging different students different prices to sit in the exact same classroom as everybody else. And they're ch deciding on that price based upon the income of the student, more typically the income of, of the student's parents. But that's an example of price discrimination. If we think about where we tend to see price discrimination take place, it happens in markets where the arbitrage potential is low. So if we think about it, it's things like movie tickets, um, let's say airline tickets. It's a situation where consumers cannot, I can't buy a ticket and then sell it to you. You wouldn't be able to get on the, the, the flight. Uh, discount coupons. We could think about financial aid. I mentioned that. We could also think about quantity discounts. That's a little bit different than what we're talking about here, but a quantity discount, something like Sam's Club or Costco, that's a situation where if you're willing to buy in larger quantities, they'll give it to you for a different price than they would charge other consumers who want to buy in smaller quantities. It's an, a form of, of price discrimination. So you can see that it happens. It's not that common, but you've probably gotten a student discount or a, if you're a student you probably haven't gotten a senior citizens discount um, maybe a military discount things like that um, let's talk also about something that we call perfect price discrimination perfect price discrimination this is a very rare form of price discrimination but it results in something that's kind of unusual and interesting so let's talk about it. Perfect price discrimination. This is a situation where the monopolist charges each consumer their maximum willingness to pay. So each consumer is charged their maximum willingness to pay. So the firm, the monopoly, would have to know your maximum willingness to pay. So you can see that this is, this is very rare. It would be rare for the firm to know what your maximum willingness to pay is. And I can tell you as a general rule, it's never in your best interest to disclose your willingness to pay. If you were to walk on to, say, a, a used car lot, the first question that they're going to ask you if they're good at their job is what are you looking to spend today? If you answer that question honestly, you probably deserve to get taken advantage of. Don't tell them what you're willing to, willing to pay. I mean, if it were me, I would, if they ask me what's my maximum willingness to pay, I would turn, around, turn it around and say, hey, you know what? I'm interested in what's your minimum amount you'll take. 
So don't ever disclose your willingness to pay. You, that just takes all of your bargaining ability away. So it's rare for the firm to know what your maximum willingness to pay is, but let's suppose they do. And, and I can tell you that, you know, to get financial aid from a university, you have to disclose pretty much your entire or your parents' entire financial condition. And so that's a situation where the firm, the university, has a pretty good idea, or at least they have data that they can use to estimate your willingness to pay. They get a pretty good idea of what your willingness to pay is with that. So let's suppose the firm does know your maximum willingness to pay. So let's look at the situation that this firm is going to be in. So let's put up here, let's, let's also use this constant marginal cost thing just to make it easy. Marginal cost equals average total cost. So we're assuming fixed cost equals zero. Again, not important that you understand even why that results in this, not, not in this class. Let's put the market demand curve up here. Here's the demand curve. Now, normally what we would do is we'd draw the marginal revenue curve, but let's think about what's happening here. If the monopoly is able to charge each consumer their maximum willingness to pay, and we recognize the fact that all of our consumers are represented along this demand curve, and those with the highest willingness to pay are up here, those with the low willingness to pay are down here, Think about this consumer with the highest willingness to pay. The firm is going to charge them that price. And then if we think about the next consumer with a little bit lower willingness to pay, the firm is going to charge them that price. And then the firm's going to charge this consumer that price, and this consumer that price. So there's not just one price. There's not two prices. There's a different price for every consumer. What that means is the price is always found along the demand curve which means our demand curve and our marginal revenue curve once again are the same curve because the additional revenue that the firm gets from an additional consumer is found on the demand curve because it represents the price that consumer is going to pay. So now if we look, now that we know that the demand curve and the marginal revenue curve are once again the same curve, marginal revenue equals marginal cost right there. There is the quantity that the perfectly price discriminating monopolist will end up producing. They will not charge one price. We can't identify any one price because every consumer is charged their maximum willingness to pay. So if we think about what's happening here, notice that if this was a perfectly competitive market, that would be what we would call Q star. That is the quantity that would be produced with perfect competition. So with perfect price discrimination, with a monopoly that can do this, we end up with the same outcome in terms of quantity that we get with perfect competition. What that means is there's no dead weight loss in this market. So with a perfectly price discriminating monopoly, dead weight loss is equal to zero. If all we're interested in is total surplus, this is as good as perfect competition. But now if you're a consumer in this type of market, think about what, your, what consumer surplus is here. If each consumer is charged their maximum willingness to pay, consumer surplus is equal to zero. All of this area, under the demand curve and above the supply curve, which if this was a competitive market, that marginal cost curve would be the supply curve, all of this area is total surplus. So total surplus is maximized, but it's also all producer surplus because consumer surplus is going to equal zero. So if we go back to our argument where we talked about the efficiency of markets and the benevolent social planner, the benevolent social planner who would be taking the point of view of society as a whole, the benevolent social planner would not have any problem with this. The benevolent social planner would say, you know what, in terms of total surplus, that's as good as perfect competition. Problem is, it would, it's bad to be a consumer in that type of market because consumer surplus is equal to zero. Consumers still get the good. It's just that they get no consumer surplus. It would be great to be the monopoly in that type of situation because producer surplus is huge. It all goes to the monopoly. So, and, and clearly, the monopoly knows everything about your willingness to pay. So it's not surprising that you end up getting the short end of the stick as the consumer. There are other types of price discrimination, and if you went on in, 
in a higher level economics class, we would talk about um, different types of price discrimination, but this gives you a good idea of kind of the, the two main forms of price discrimination. Perfect price discrimination, and then the type of price discrimination where they can break consumers up into a high willingness to pay group and a low willingness to pay group. But this should give you an idea of what happens with this far end of the competitive spectrum where there's no competition. What we're going to do in the next couple of videos is we're going to talk about what comes in between there, monopolistic competition and uh, oligopoly. So I'll see you in those videos.